Okay, it looks, looks like Joe's got a question over here um, relating to alcohol. <laughs> Just to finish up where we are on the alcohol issue, yeah. it seems that the split age is actually quite a clever idea. It ensures that at 18 you can enter into an unlicensed establishment yep. and drink in a supervised setting. Mm -hmm. And that by getting rid of that option, you're actually forcing students to drink unsupervised in their own flat and even going to the extremes of brewing their own alcohol in unsanitary conditions, which is actually already happening here in Dunedin. Yeah, so well, I'm just wondering exactly why you don't feel that that's yeah. a good option. Well, I think you've just answered the question. It is already happening. And you're quite right, that will continue to happen. And I acknowledge the point that you're making. Um, if the vote were to be taken in the current parliament, I think that the split age would get the support of the majority of MPs. I mean, to be honest, um, my amendment now won't be voted on until the next parliament, so we don't know what the shape of that parliament will be. It's a conscience vote, which means that parties, MPs don't have to vote according to a party line. Um, and I acknowledge I probably struggle to get the numbers, but I do think it's important that MPs have that option because if you take a poll anywhere around the country, the vast majority of people will respond saying push the purchase age back up to 20. And I know that because I've done a, a survey of my electorate last year, online poll on my website. Um, I've had a number of public meetings in my electorate. Every one they've ever had has always come back with a vast majority in favour of pushing the purchase age back up to 20. And then just a quick follow-up. You've got two uh, rather young daughters. Will they be over 20 before the school uh, passes? Well, well, <laughs> actually, my older daughter will be 21 in 10 days, and the younger one is 19, so she probably wouldn't be thrilled. Um, I don't know that I'll necessarily pick up her vote on this one, but as I say, I think that um, MPs have to have this option, and in the next parliament they'll get that option. And of course, the amendment will also the, the opportunity for an amendment to keep it at 18, as it is now, will also be there. So I guess MPs will have three different choices, and it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Okay, we've got another question down here from Nikki Lomax, uh, honours politics student. It's kind of related. It, um, do you think that in our system, particularly with like list MPs? Yep. We don't vote for them in the sense we don't know what their moral, where their conscience lies on things yeah. in the same way that mm. we do when somebody runs for electorate. So mm. do you think that like, conscience votes potentially are flawed in that way and maybe issues like the drinking age should be something that's put to referendum? So that's an interesting question, Nikki, and you, you make a good point because you don't know what the conscience um, thoughts on these types of issues are when you're voting for a party list. I mean, I would have to go to a meeting and be asked for my views on every conscience issue for my electorate to be able to say, well, I may not like where he stands on this, that and the other, but I'm going to vote for him because I do like what he's talking about here. Should we be able to put these things to a referendum? Um, you'd probably end up having a heck of a lot of them. And of course, most referenda are non-binding, so that always creates a fairly cynical uh, response from the electorate as well. Personally, I would like to see greater use of referendum, um, but that's a personal view. Uh, should this one go to um, a referendum? I'd be reasonably comfortable with that. Uh, I think you'd find if you have a referendum on it, it will overwhelmingly be to raise the purchase age back up to 20 across the board. So students might not <coughs> like that option. Yeah, but at the same time, that's still more democratic, so. Yeah, yeah, I, and I agree with that. I, th I, I think you've made a good point. Um, uh, this is uh, Finn, he's also an honours politics. Hi, Finn. How are you doing? Um, don't you feel like, I mean, obviously you don't, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it seems like a little bit of a cop out um, just raising the drinking age. Obviously, we have a societal mm. drinking problem, but yep. what evidence is there that that's actually going to make any difference? Do I think it's a cop out? No, but I would agree with you that it's only one part of a much bigger picture. And there's a huge amount that's in the alcohol reform bill that I think is going to be really good. Uh, ultimately, however, you can't legislate any of these problems out of existence that comes down to culture change, a little bit more personal responsibility. My personal view is that actually it would make a difference to raise the purchase age. Um, as I come back to the point that I made to Bryce before, that one of the reasons that I think we've got a huge problem is that we've got a lot of 18 year olds who can at the moment buy alcohol and there is nothing to stop them supplying it to even younger people. And we know that in car parks, on sports fields, rugby club rooms, you name it, all around the country at the moment, there are a lot of 15 and 16 year olds drinking alcohol, often to excess, that's been supplied to them by 18 year olds. And so that purchase age, I think, by raising that, we will limit uh, that problem. We won't solve the problem, but we'll reduce it. So the logic is that <coughs> you raise it to 20 and then it's 20 year olds buying for 17 and 18 year olds? No, well I think it's less likely to happen. I mean, it's still, sure, 20 year olds will still buy it and supply it to younger people, but it's less likely that you get a 20 year old supplying it to a 15 year old Whereas the 18 year old might be the captain of the school netball or rugby team or something and buying it for the 15 or 16 year olds in the team. 
So it will actually just reduce the amount of alcohol being supplied to young people. And I mean, the other thing I could have just make a serious point is there is plenty of very persuasive evidence that the brain is not properly developed until somebody is well into their 20s. If you are regularly drinking significant quantities of alcohol, then you are likely to have a long-term uh, significant uh, problem from that. I'm not saying you necessarily become an alcoholic, but the younger you are when you are regularly drinking, the more likely you are to develop alcohol problems later on in life. Okay, the next logical area of questioning is uh, Don Brash. Are you a supporter of his, uh, his, his desire to decriminalise uh, marijuana no, or I'm any not. drugs? No, I'm not. So I don't believe taking a soft line on drugs is appropriate. I mean, it'd be bizarre for me to take the line that I have on alcohol and then turn around and say, well, let's decriminalise marijuana. Uh, mm -hmm. I've certainly read carefully some of the information I've had from people saying, well, how about medicinal cannabis? Mm -hmm. And I can understand that there may be some people who would benefit from medicinal, medicinal cannabis. I'm not a medical mm -hmm. person, so mm -hmm. I'm not uh, an expert on that. However, I don't believe that taking a soft line on drugs is appropriate. We've got a huge problem with very hard drugs in our community, and the last thing I want to do is make it easier to get onto a soft drug, which was the sure. entry level for okay. harder drugs down the line. Oh, there's a few other social issues that students are quite interested in yep. um, at the moment. Um, gay marriage, for or against? Against. Against. So having said that, um, I appreciate the fact that gay couples have an absolute right to enjoy legal protection of their interests. They, you know, if there's the dissolution of a civil union or something, then they have a right to have the protection of the law. It's yeah. just my personal view that marriage is um, between a man and a woman. Okay. Well, moving right on, I guess, to just <laughs> bigger ideological yep. questions, if that's not big enough already. Um, I, I guess you know, I've been reading up on your background and your, uh, some of your political beliefs, yep. and mm -hmm. I, I found, I mean, you're quite intriguing in a sense. You've got some quite, I wouldn't say contradictory sort of ideological beliefs, but on the one hand, you kind of come across as quite an establishment sort of traditional true blue Tory <laughs> yeah. in the sense that you, you know, you're involved in, I think, the Waikato Chamber of Commerce or a member, oh, member that, um, yep, yep. field days stuff, you know, mm. um, RSA, you know, mm. traditional sort of yeah. National mm. Party uh, member in that sense. Mm -hmm. But um, Having yeah. said that, I'm not a returned serviceman. Right, but you're <laughs> may, involved I'm, in it. I may look like it. Oh, well, yeah. as an MP, you do yeah. get involved yeah. in, in organisations, yeah. and I'm very proud to be because it's yeah. an opportunity sure. to connect with my community. Just trying to get a sense of you know, your, your yeah. political sort of yep. Uh, yep. beliefs and ideolo ideology. And, but on the other hand, and also, I guess, in your maiden speech, which I read, which is you know, very interesting, uh, you kind of hinted that you're a monarchist, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and, I, I think um, that our constitutional arrangements serve us pretty well. I don't think that the alternatives that have been proposed would be yep. as effective. Uh, we've got safeguards in there. Yep. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to get out and wave a flag every time the Queen comes to New Zealand, right. but I do think that the constitutional monarchy yep. is a good arrangement for New Zealand. And you talk a bit in the maiden speech about patriotism and hmm. um, teaching children the you know, senses of duty and so forth. Yep. Mm -hmm. So to me it sounded like you kind of... Um, Pretty sort of socially conservative, and I so. uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. then there were some other things. You, you gave a lot of your, part of your speech in Te Reo, was that right? Yes. Uh, yeah. And you talked in your speech about um, other parts of your background that don't quite fit that sort of mould, such as um, what was it? Tu uh, as a tutor in Christchurch Woman's Prison. Prison that's right. Um, yeah. you, before yeah. this this gig, you were yeah. what head of uh, Waikato Arts, that's Arts right. Waikato. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you have a number of sort of liberal. Um, an involvement in a number of liberal sort of areas as well. Oh, I have to think back to what they were, but um, all sorts, yeah. of, especially um, environmental things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm. uh, and you've also expressed, I guess, a sense that you're probably not that economically right wing. I don't yeah. know. No, that's right. So I, I get a mm. sense that you kind of what sometimes is talked, not really much in New Zealand, but in political science, especially elsewhere, is a, a, a red Tory in the sense that. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm red. But I'm well, certainly not on the right wing of the really national You're not really dark party. blue, are you? No. No. No, I'm centre right. Centre right? Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, and or a compassionate conservative. A compassionate conservative is the that... way I like to describe okay. my political philosophy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so I just wonder if you could talk a bit more about your positioning there, as opposed mm. to being yeah more right wing or more. Well, um, yeah, sure. Happy sure. to do that. I mean, I guess my philosophy is that 
uh, there will always be people in our community who need help from the state. I mean, those who are on the far right would say, well, let's just shut down welfare and mm. let the market rule. I don't subscribe to that view at all. I think that there are a number of people who need the assistance of the state, and I would like the state to be in a position to be as generous as possible. In order to do that, we have to ensure that we have a flourishing economy and that we minimise abuse of the system. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in constantly um, monitoring our welfare provisions to make sure that they remain up to date, that they're meeting the needs of the community, because needs change over okay. time. So on welfare, you're pretty sort of supportive or pro the welfare state. Um, well, actually, yeah. go back to the 90s when you were you know, first standing for parliament. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm guessing you weren't a big fan of, say, Ruth Richardson and her sort of neo or Roger Douglas's neoliberal approach to economics? Uh, I can see that a lot of what they did was necessary and it caught, brought about some structural reform of the economy that we did need to go through, but it was incredibly painful. Um, I mean, Rudgenomics was pretty brutal at the time it was happening mm. and a number of people did get really mm. badly hurt. I p guess I prefer the more pragmatic approach of John Key and Bill English, which is don't get too far ahead of the punters, make sure you carry the country with you. And I'm very comfortable with the stance that they've been taking. After all, we are managing an economy through the most difficult times we've known since the Great Depression. And we're doing it in a way that, yeah, it's tough. Some people have lost jobs. That's inevitable. But when you look at the international situation at the moment, I think actually we're doing it pretty well. And I don't believe that sort of a, a blitzkrieg approach of perhaps the uh, early 90s would be appropriate at the moment. OK. Now we've got another question from Joe. Just one of the other dichotomies, if you will, Tim, in your political ideology is your, your background in working in agriculture and also your environmental credentials. Yeah. And I'm just kind of wondering what you view as the future of agriculture in New Zealand and well, when and how it should be included in the emissions trading scheme. I shouldn't overstate that. I had a job as a uh, working on a farm. Uh, which one of my university vacations. I'd never claim to be uh, <laughs> actively involved in agriculture, although naturally it's very important. And as a Waikato MP, I fully appreciate just how important agriculture is to my region and uh, it's the backbone of the strength of our region at the moment. What's the future of agriculture? I believe very, very strong. Uh, 20 years ago, we had some politicians describing agriculture as a sunset industry. They have been proved completely wrong and thank goodness they have because as we look to the future, one of the great strengths we have as a country is that we're a food producing nation and the world wants what we can produce and we can produce it really well. The environmental side? easy to reconcile. We have to ensure that we produce it in a way that the world is going to say, I like their, their values, I like the emphasis they're putting on sustainability, on trying to ensure that we clean up our rivers, all the rest of it. And I'm really excited about that sort of work. Okay. 